Coming up on Nebraska Stories, Father Flanagan's path to sainthood. A look back at the life of General John J. Pershing. Rediscovering the works of a lost writer and exploring Nebraska City's enchanted forest of art. On June 18, 2015, a special Mass was held at the Cathedral of St. Cecilia in Omaha. The celebratory service marked the end of the local investigation into the life and virtue of renowned founder of Boys Town, Monsignor Edward Flanagan. The Omaha Diocese is seeking sainthood for the Catholic priest. Saint-making is a nearly 2,000-year-old ancient rite and a rare part of the church. It is a complex, mysterious process with rules that must be strictly followed. In the Catholic faith, there are two ways a person may become a saint, through martyrdom or heroic virtue. Heroic virtue is defined as performing extraordinary virtuous actions while upholding the practice of faith, hope, and charity to a high degree. We want the court to find him guilty of heroic virtue, because that's what makes a saint. Dr. Andrea Ambrosi is unofficially known as the Saint Maker. An expert in canon law, he traveled from Italy to assist in finalizing the diocese investigation. The inquiries are considered trials in a way, like a trial of the person's life to see whether they are deserving of the titles. The canonization process is fundamentally a legal proceeding of the church. Steve Wolf is the president of a grassroots group comprised of ordinary people who are presenting a case before the Vatican to make Father Flanagan a saint. The Flanagan League is essentially, we are the actors in this cause for canonization. We are the, the petitioners to the church asking the church to look at this man's life and, and determine whether he lived a life of heroic virtue. Born prematurely on July 13, 1886 in County Roscommon, Ireland, Edward Joseph Flanagan was the eighth child of parents Nora and John. He was bright and studious, but suffered from frail health. He emigrated to America in 1904 with hopes of becoming a priest. It took him eight years due to chronic health issues, but after being ordained in 1912, Father Edward Flanagan moved to Omaha, where his brother Patrick was already serving as a parish priest. It was while helping people displaced from the devastating Easter tornadoes of 1913 that Father Flanagan found purpose in helping the homeless. In 1917, when a boy asked the priest for shelter, it set in motion a chain of events that evolved into what is now known as Boys Town. This was a place that wasn't there to kick you to the curb for your experience, it was a place to lift you up. In the late 1970s, Steve Wolf was a Boys Town boy. I had an immediate sense of relief just not being locked up. You were there to be uh, this kid that had all these opportunities and, and an education and all these other things to help you be successful. The very things Steve benefited from in the 1970s Father Flanagan began instituting 60 years before when he took in his first five boys. In 1917, he borrowed $90 to rent a boarding house he called Father Flanagan's Home for Boys. By 1921, he had 150 boys and wanted to help even more. But his work was drawing criticism from the public because people believed there was no hope for a bad kid. Father Flanagan was not only helping them, he was accepting boys of mixed religions and race. 
and not segregating them. He began receiving violent death threats. Working together, Father Flanagan and his boys raised enough money to purchase a farm on the outskirts of Omaha. Here there was safety and space to grow. And they changed the name of Overlook Farm to the village of Boys Town. During the next 20 years, Father Flanagan railed against the juvenile justice system and advocated reform. And despite angering powerful authorities, he gained overwhelming public support for his work. And in 1938, Hollywood released the movie Boys Town. I'm Father Flanagan. I saw your brother Joe just a little while ago. We had a long talk about you, Whitey. Joe wants you to come to Boys Town with me. If you think you're gonna make a plow jockey out of me, you got another thing coming. And was a box office success. It gave international attention to Boys Town, and now Monsignor Flanagan was publicly accepted as an expert in youth care. Is that what this is all about? You're gonna take my life because I owe the state something? Where was the state when a lonely, starving kid cried himself to sleep in a flop house with a bunch of drunks, tramps, and hobos? The Monsignor's that that success in Nebraska gave him the courage to address reform in the land of his birth. Where atrocities of the juvenile justice system were far greater than in the United States. In 1946, Father Flanagan returned to Ireland and gave public speeches denouncing church and state-run industrial schools, calling them institutions of punishment. While the crowds cheered, the government not only decried Father Flanagan's criticism, it later expunged nearly all record of their native son. After the end of World War II, General Douglas MacArthur asked Father Flanagan to work on child welfare issues in Asia. When the Catholic priest reported his findings to President Truman, the president was so impressed, he asked Father Flanagan to help in Europe. Father Flanagan was planning to return to Ireland, but postponed his visit. In February of 1948, he left for Austria and Germany. The tour was exhausting. He confided in friends that his heart was giving him trouble and said, this has been a very hard trip. Then, shortly after midnight on May 15, 1948, the founder of Boys Town suffered a massive heart attack. He was transferred to a hospital and died soon after. He was brought home to Nebraska, and today he rests in the heart of Boys Town. A cause is supposed to start in the place where the person died, not where they maybe did their work and not necessarily where they're buried. In their pursuit for the cause of Father Flanagan's sainthood, the League had an immediate hurdle to jump. The Cardinal of Berlin had the jurisdiction for this cause to be open, and so we had to communicate with him to ask if he would please transfer the case to the Archdiocese of Omaha, and he agreed. The negotiation was handled through Dr. Ambrosi. In his role as Vatican postulator, Dr. Ambrosi is presenting Father Flanagan's case for sainthood to the Vatican. The completion of the diocesan, or local, investigation means the Vatican is moving to the next step in the sainthood process. Nine Vatican theologians who make up the Congregation for the Causes of the Saints will now review the records compiled by the Omaha Diocese. It's funny because it took us uh, almost 12 years to get to that phone call. And then to realize after that, like a relief, it's like, well, actually now we're at the beginning of the beginning. Fifteen thousand documents enclosed in four boxes and wrapped in brown paper, then sealed in wax, represent the life and work of a man who many consider one of the finest humanitarians of the 20th century. 
Certo, non sanno quello che verrà dopo, okay. ma su quello non è che io posso dire molto, insomma, okay. capito? The fact that a cause was initiated is already a sign that, that Father Flanagan has a, has a great reputation of holiness uh, already among the people of Omaha and of Nebraska. He made a major change in the American system of care. He also wanted to shame every orphanage, especially the Christian orphanages, into behaving more civilly with the kids and treating them nicer. He set a new model and America has followed it. You know, what a great, um, what a great moment to honor a man that has helped so, so many lives and inspired so many other people to do good things in this world. So um, just very joyful right now, very ecstatic. And uh, it's just, just a great day uh, to celebrate the man and his mission. We all know the world is full of boys who through ignorance, neglect, and perhaps thoughtlessness have violated the laws of God and man. It is also true that these problem boys have presented and still are presenting a grave situation in our social order, notwithstanding the fact that our country is singularly blessed with facilities for producing good citizens. If the future of our country is to be secure from dangerous enemies from within, parents and guardians of children must become more conscious of the responsibilities which God has placed upon them. We must become more virtuous in our own lives, that we may teach more effectively the lesson of proper citizenship by example as well as instruction. Kindness and love will open the heart of any problem boy. That heart will melt within the warmth of the sunshine of love. I have really never found a boy who wanted to be bad. A century ago, World War I raged in Europe. Historians say the war made the U.S. a global superpower. General John J. Pershing, a man with strong Nebraska ties, commanded the U.S. troops that helped to end the bloody fighting. Over there, over there. November 11th, 1918, America and the world celebrated an end to World War I. 3,000 miles from home, an American army is fighting for you. Four years of fighting claimed millions of lives before U.S. troops, led by General John J. Pershing, arrived in France. Just like Washington crossed the Delaware, so will Pershing cross the Rhine. They were called the American Expeditionary Forces and joined the French and British to turn the battle tide against the German military. In 18 months, General Pershing helped to transform 220,000 U.S. troops into a fighting force of 4 million. He should be thought of as a quintessential American man. Right place, right time. General Pershing became the only acting six-star general in U.S. history. Today, though, his name is recognized by few people, even in Nebraska, where an important part of Pershing's life unfolded. In 1891, the 31-year-old Pershing thought seriously about leaving the Army after four years in the 6th Cavalry. He had commanded frontier outposts in the Indian War, and there seemed to be few promotional opportunities left for First Lieutenant Pershing. So after times you know, chasing Native Americans in Arizona and other places, uh, he does get a chance to take a break. Pershing's break was a transfer to the University of Nebraska. Here in Lincoln, he has a sense of having arrived. 
Pershing taught military science at the University of Nebraska and began work on a law degree. Most importantly, Pershing took charge of the school's failing military training program and its 100 cadets. Underrated, secondhand, nobody gave two hoots about the program. Under Pershing's command, McNeese says things quickly changed. Pershing instilled something in his cadets that they hadn't had before. It was discipline. Better button up that coat. You better get wired. Your shoes not polished. And all these farm boys are kind of, wait, 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 who's, who's this guy and why, what, what, what? Within a year, 350 students joined Pershing's UNL Cadet Corps. And by 1892, Pershing's cadets were ready to be tested in a national military drill competition. UNL's elite cadet squad competed in Omaha against veteran teams from across the country. When it was announced that Pershing's UNL cadets had won their division, hundreds of UNL students and faculty climbed over the fence and charged the parade field to celebrate. And they were led by UNL Chancellor James Canfield. Well, He's even the chancellor of the, of the university, <laughs> right. yeah, Chancellor yeah. Canfield, is, is, who is not a, not a small man, is, is climbing over this eight-foot-tall fence. In 1895, Pershing's time at UNL came to an end. In honor of their recently departed lieutenant, UNL's elite drill team renamed itself Pershing's Rifles. Today, units like them across the country are known as the National Society of Pershing Rifles. In the decades that followed, Pershing commanded U.S. troops in the Spanish-American War. In the Philippines, he was promoted to the rank of one-star general. Now married with a wife and four children, Pershing's life seemed complete until tragedy struck in 1915. Pershing's wife Frankie and their three young daughters died in a San Francisco fire. The fire's only survivor was Pershing's five-year-old son Warren. Pershing privately poured his crushing sorrow into the command of 10,000 U.S. troops sent to hunt Mexican Revolutionary General Francisco Pancho Villa. Pershing's son Warren, now the most important person in the general's life, lived in Lincoln, Nebraska with Pershing's two sisters. October 31, 1916. My dear little boy. Recently, Pershing's granddaughter-in-law read a 1916 letter the general wrote from Mexico to his son in Lincoln. This small red flag with one white star in the center is the flag that has been in front of your papa's tent for several months. As I now must have two stars in my flag, I am sending you this one to keep as a souvenir. With it goes all the love of my soul. May God keep you and help you to be a good and great man. A year later, Pershing would command American troops in World War I. Only the hardest blows can win against the enemy we are fighting. America's sacrifices in the Great War were enormous. More than 323,000 U.S. troops died, were wounded, or went missing. America's victory, though, gave the U.S. global recognition as a leader of the free world and a superpower with a modern military. A turning point in John Pershing's long journey that once led through Nebraska. But if you look at the army that Pershing left behind, it has been turned into a modern force with a large standing army. Pershing wasn't the only architect of that, but he was the most important person to execute that, that transformation. For 90 years, Prairie Schooner, a literary journal published at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, has been featuring stories, poems, essays, and reviews by promising writers. The catalog includes famous contributors like Mari Sandos and Willa Cather, as well as remarkable authors who, for various reasons, became lost to modern readers. One of the exciting things about going into back issues of, of a journal like Prairie Schooner, and it's a really great resource because you're talking about almost a hundred years of work that is immediately contemporary. The so-called lost writers from Prairie Schooner's archives include Nebraska native Irvin Krauss. 
He writes a lot about characters on the edge. They're people who are um, often living the lives similar to, to, to the life he led as a boy. He's, he was from a family of, of tenant farmers, basically. They moved from farm to farm throughout Nebraska and Iowa, and he was one of five brothers. And, and so he, they, uh, you know, they lived in some level of, of poverty. Krauss's writing is full of amoral characters and sinister plots. He was met with both praise and controversy. His short story, Anniversary, is about a guy named Donald who visits an old girlfriend, Wanda, a single mother living in Lincoln. It was deemed obscene by university officials who removed the entire piece from Prairie Schooner. Carl Shapiro, the editor, defended the story, saying that I believe his term for the in, in the New York Times was something like a couple of washed out bedroom scenes or something like that. Shawford believes the administration became nervous about the direction of editor Carl Shapiro, who was a fan of beat poets and wanted to seek out provocative writing in the 1960s. Former U.S. Poet Laureate Ted Kuzer says the reason he started graduate school in 1963 at UNL was because Shapiro was teaching at the university. The English department wasn't quite sure what to do with a real poet either, you know, they, they were all academics. He had an office kind of stuffed off into a corner of Andrews Hall as if to keep him away from the students as much as possible. Shapiro stepped down as editor of Prairie Schooner over the censorship issue, and shortly after, Irvin Krauss was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease and died when he was just 39. I think that in the 1960s, before his death, he was really on the edge of success. I think that had he lived into the 1970s, he would have published more work, and I think it would have gained momentum. I mean, writers in their 30s, that's when they're really kind of starting to find their ground and to find their subject matter and to find their readers. And so he was focusing on his health when um, he might have otherwise been focusing on his career. To read more about Irvin Krauss and other lost writers, visit netnebraska.org slash lostwriters and get the free iBook. The project is really about bringing something new to Nebraska City to change and beautify the landscape, to bring the community together, to give people just one more reason to come here. My piece is all four seasons and it's about Grandma Moses. She inspired me. On this side is summer. It has all the greens and all the animals. Over here is winter, snowball fights and snow. Over here is fall. There's leaves falling and birds, calm and peaceful. This is spring. Things are blooming, trees are blossoming. It's getting warmer. They're just all like, I don't know, they're all so cool and, the, and every kid has such a unique way of expressing their art that they were learning about at the time and, and I don't know if any of these kids are ever going to grow up to be artists, but they kind of already are because of this. When I heard that I got chosen to have my design, it was just a dream really like people my age don't really get to do things like this to have my art career start like this is amazing it's really great the name of my piece is called the hidden shelter in nebraska city you see trees everywhere and that's what inspired me to have people recognize trees and see that they're not just little 
decorations around the town. There's things that live in the tree and the trees are important to wildlife and nature and the environment. The zipper was my own touch, so like revealing what lives inside the tree. And I'm actually on the committee that put this all together, but I, bu I bought that tree for myself. <laughs> I bought this one for my parents, I bought that one for myself. I just couldn't, couldn't help myself, it was fantastic. My tree is called a natural tapestry. I've always loved the idea of public art, but actually getting to be a part of the public art project and the process has really shown me how incredibly powerful something like this can be. People come together and I think make it happen. Watch our stories online at netnebraska.org slash Nebraska Stories and go to Facebook to like us and leave a comment. Join the Nebraska Stories conversation. Nebraska Stories is funded by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation, the Nebraska Office of Highway Safety, Humanities Nebraska, the Nebraska Tourism Commission, and First Nebraska Bank. Sustained funding for arts coverage is provided by the H. Lee and Carol Gendler Charitable Fund, the Nebraska Arts Council, and Nebraska Cultural Endowment.